Purdue University in the Philosophy and Literature program. She, she received her MA in Philosophy at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology in Berkeley, California. She very recently submitted her dissertation, Plato's Metaphysics of Soul, which, rumor has it, ain't funny at all. <laughs> uh, an active member in the Lighthearted Philosopher's Society, Sophia recently taught a four-part series on Jewish humor to eighth and ninth grade students, which she claims was the most depressing teaching assignment of her life. Uh, Sophia is also the mother of 1.5 children and, uh, <laughs> and the wife of a high school biology teacher. The title of the paper she will be reading this evening is A Wittgensteinian Analysis of Stephen Colbert's Humor. So nice to see so many friends in the audience. So I want to thank you for being here. It's a real pleasure and a, quite an honor to be presenting this paper. I uh, wrote this paper in 2008, so it's been a while. So it's nice to come back to it. I don't know that I'll be able to answer any questions. My head's been in Plato this, uh, this last week. All right. The Colbert Report maintains a huge following for its comic parody of cable news bloviating. But what is it exactly that makes Stephen Colbert funny? His wit? His insight? His wicked Neil Diamond impersonations? Can the question of what makes something funny be answerable through a philosophical account of humor? Through the lens of the philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein, we can come up with a robust theory of humor that will answer these questions and many more, but not, unfortunately, why my Uncle Larry insists on wearing his trench coat to dinner. One day in 2008, Starbucks closed its shops for three hours to retain their baristas to perfect the making of espresso shots. The event from the ubiquitous coffee conglomerate made the headlines. While reporters mentioned that what went on in the training sessions talked about the press release from Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz or how the closing impacted local mom and pop coffee shops, the Colbert Report did something a little different. The Starbucks event was declared the number one threat facing America. Stephen Colbert reported how the closing personally affected him, a special self-interest report. At 5.30, we see a frustrated Stephen Colbert trying to open a door to a closed Starbucks. Then we see him drinking out of a cafe au lait coffee cup with 10 tea bag teas dangling from the sides. The next clip shows a sweaty Stephen Colbert on an exercise machine, exaggerating his movements and then posing as if in slow motion. The camera zooms in on the clock that now says six. Stephen Colbert digs through the trash and finds a used Starbucks coffee cup, throws his head back and attempts to drink any last drop. Failing, he takes the end of the, coffee, the paper cup and burns the edge, using his cupped fingers to wave the burning aroma into his nostrils. <laughs> Next scene, we see a disgruntled Stephen Colbert at the office yelling, I hate you, to a fellow co coworker. As he walks down the hall towards the camera, he pushes anyone aside who gets in his way. Camera shot to the clock now says quarter to eight. Stephen Colbert is in an undisclosed basement, tied up and choking, acting like a rabid man. Clock now says 8.30 and we see Stephen Colbert finally entering a Starbucks. Last scene, Stephen Colbert taking a shower, about to drink from a Starbucks coffee cup, and instead, he pours it on his head. He takes another Starbucks coffee cup, takes off the lid, dips his four fingers in the cup, and takes out whipped cream, and smears it all over his chest and presumably his genitals. Finally, he takes a shaker of pumpkin spice and sprinkles it all over his chest. So I just have to have a, a, say a caveat here that I wrote this paper without, being, um, without knowing about Victor Raskin's work. And uh, if I were to write this paper again, I would write this completely different. Um, there are numerous theories of humor that expl could explain why we find Stephen Colbert sprinkling pumpkin spice on his chest funny. 
The three main contenders are superiority theory, relief theory, and incongruity theory. Superiority theory claims that the cause of our laughter is due to the feeling of superiority we feel to the object of our laughter. So perhaps we laugh at Stephen Colbert sniffing the fumes of a burning Starbucks cup because there's nothing funnier than watching a junkie suffer. The relief theory holds that we laugh because we have repressed desires that need to be released. So maybe we laugh when Stephen Colbert drinks from the many tea bag cup because of our own fear of doing without coffee and having to work with a grumpy boss. Or, a la Freud, we might have some pent-up sexual anxiety that is related to not having caffeine, and seeing the many teabagged cup over stimulates our libido and causes us to laugh. Or maybe it's just funny to watch Stephen Colbert get teabagged. The incongruity theory explains <laughs> that we laugh because we expect one thing to happen and then something else happens. We may have laughed when Stephen Colbert dumps coffee on his head in the shower because we expected him to drop, drink the coffee while showering, but who are we to judge? Each one of these theories, however, is limited to a particular kind of humor. The problem is that they explain all facets of Stephen Colbert's humor with one explanation. The superiority theory explains why we laugh at how desperate Stephen Colbert becomes in dealing with his withdrawal from Starbucks coffee. We feel elevated to a higher status when we see him suffer. And this explanation carries over to the other examples of his humor. The superiority ex explanation becomes the only focal point of the humor, while in fact we may laugh for other reasons. And this point was made by Raskin in his 1985 Semantic Mechanisms of Humor. So it wasn't I was reinventing the wheel, so to speak, when I wrote this paper. If we were to continue with this theory, we would have to explain that the reason why we laugh when Stephen Colbert pours coffee on himself while showering is because we think we are better than that. The theory would not take into account our surprise and the oddity of pouring coffee over oneself in the shower. The relief theory explains our laughter is due to some pent-up fear of our emotion and desperately needing coffee and having to continue on without it. The relief theory would explain why we laugh at Stephen Colbert pushing his co-workers out of the way. In this case, the reason again is because we too have a secret desire to be mean to the people we work with, and who wouldn't after what they said about us last week. The theory reduces the reason why we laugh at Stephen Colbert's humor always to some repressed desire we have. The relief theory doesn't give a satisfying account for why we laugh at the ridiculousness of Stephen Colbert on an exercise machine. Unless, of course, we say that we have all been there and have done that before, and we are relieved by some sort of hidden anxiety we feel about having to go through it again. While it is true that in most scenarios, what Stephen Colbert does is contrary to our expectation, it is not clear that this is the reason why we laugh. Sometimes we laugh because we are surprised, but other times we laugh because of the extent of the ridiculousness. The problem with these theories is that they focus on a single cause, while there seem to be multiple reasons for why we laugh. Just as there are varieties of people and paralyzing phobias, there are a variety of ways people can understand humor and different reasons for why they laugh and why they're afraid of small, flightless birds. Sometimes we laugh because in a silly way, since what Stephen Colbert says is absolutely true and he's revealing something about the way we live, act, and think. What is needed is a philosophy of humor that can account for all the different ways Stephen Colbert makes people laugh. That account should also be able to do more than that, though. This should also be able to explain why some people laugh at Stephen Colbert's humor while others do not. And while no one comedian can be funny all the time, how can we account for the fact that even when Stephen Colbert bombs his jokes, he can still be funny? In short, what we need is a theory of humor that does not force one explanation for all the different kinds of humor like the theories mentioned earlier. We need a theory that allows for multiple explanations for why we laugh, does the dishes, and makes us breakfast in the morning. Ludwig Wittgenstein was an Austrian philosopher who devoted his life to articulating the problems of philosophy that are due to language. He had many innovative ideas in the philosophy of language, logic, mathematics, and psychology. 
Though much of philosophical work has been done with Wittgenstein's writings, there's still more we gain, especially with what he has written on humor. Keep in mind when reading the next couple of sections that I'm, well, when I'm listening to the next couple of sections that I'm drawing my ideas from Wittgenstein, and not at all challenge, claiming to challenging them from his grave. And I think you'd probably object to my using his ideas to develop a theory of humor, right? He doesn't like theories. He writes, humor is not a mood, but a way of looking at the world. This way of looking at the world is particular to some to specific cultures and time periods, and also differs from person to person. How we interact with one another, the words and mannerisms we use, are also cultural and time specific. One of the tools we use to interact with others is language. In his philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein likens the use of language to the using of tools in a toolbox. There are many tools in a toolbox, each one has a different job and works in a different way. Just like there are many words and grammatical rules, they each have a different use and work in a different way. Some to amuse, some to seduce, and some to scare the bejesus out of those pesky kids who keep wrecking my lawn. Another analogy Wittgenstein gives for using for language is the example of the controls on a train. Some lovers push and pull, others turn, and some aren't connected with anything at all. As we speak and interact with one another, we are constantly learning new words, finding new ways to use some expressions, and likewise, we leave some colloquial expressions behind. So humor is part of language, and it too constantly changes. Think of the different styles of comedy and the com comedians who have passed. Think of the humor your grandparents laugh at versus the humor you laugh at. Sometimes the humor carries over from generation to generation, but most often it does not. Wittgenstein remarks, what we call wit and humor doubtless did not exist in other ages, and both are constantly changing. Part of this change is context, but also the taste of humor, this changes as well. We'll return to these ideas of context and ta ta taste and humor later. One of Wittgenstein's contributions to the philosophy of language is his idea of a language game. The term language game is meant to bring into prominence the fact that speaking of language is part of an activity or a form of life. When we communicate with one another, we participate in a language game. Like any game, we need to follow established rules, and like some games, there is an element of improvisation. Among the multiplicity of language games that we engage in is making a joke, telling it, and play acting. Stephen Colbert is often funny because of the way he twists and mixes language games. When we react, we laugh and discuss what we see with one another. We too are engaging in a language game. Often we are engaged in more than one game at a time depending on the situation and circumstances. Just as there are many tools that we use in a toolbox, there are endless variations on how we use language. When we engage in humor, either because we laugh spontaneously at something naturally, or we laugh due to something that was fabricated for our amusement, we are participating in language games. The rules for these language games, the tools we use, are constantly evolving or constantly changing. Thus, we need a robust theory of humor that allows for the fluidity and flexibility of the language games we call humor. As I define it, humor is an aspect change. An aspect change is the thinking of something different when perceiving. The focus could be an object, a situation, or an activity. Another name for this is aspect dominant. Wittgenstein uses this term for picture objects, objects that can be seen under more than one aspect. We could be looking at a face, a face we've seen a hundred times before, and then suddenly we see something new. The face hasn't changed. It is either our seeing or our interpreting that has changed. One time I stared at Uncle Larry's nose until I saw him Abraham Lincoln. We laugh because we see the world, and then we see it differently. The change of aspect happens to the one who thinks it. For a robust theory, though, we need more than just this concept. We need a humorous attitude, a shared form of life, and a vowel, a good pair of rubber gloves, and a 10-foot pole for just 
good for measure. First, however, we need a discussion on aspect change. Wittgenstein was interested in aspect change as an answer to, para to a paradox left by the psychologist Joseph Jastrow in his book, Fact and Fable in Psychology. Consider the illustration of a duck rabbit. And this is his illustration, Wittgenstein's, where the picture is both a rabbit and a duck. It is one picture with two images, though one cannot see the two images at the same time. Looked at one way, focusing on lines drawn like a very tall M on one side of the picture, the M becomes a bill, the picture is a duck. Looked at another way, focusing on the other side, but seeing the M now as a pair of ears, it is a rabbit. What's interesting about the duck rabbit is that though it's possible to see both images, it's not possible to see them at the same time. The same image looks now like a duck, now like a rabbit. Why is this? How is this? How can we see two different concepts but one picture? What changes? The picture, the mind, the perception? Wittgenstein's lectures on aspect change often began with him reading from Kohler's Gestalt Psychology. Gestalt theory says we see two pictures, but not at the same time. The lines that are drawn in the shape of the duck's bill and rabbit ears, distinctive shapes, cause our minds to form one picture than another. The mind perceives a whole picture out of seemingly disparate parts. Wittgenstein was unsatisfied with the Gestalt theorist's answer, but it is difficult to say why. It could be that Wittgenstein was skeptical of claims that declared a single psychological cause for human perceptions. Often we think of something because of our surroundings, our past and present experience, and perhaps also of things we don't take into consideration, like taste or smell. In the published writings that we have from Wittgenstein, he was never explicit in saying why the Gestalt explanation was inadequate. He was interested in the concept of the aspect change as something that happens in language. This he discusses in the second part of his philosophical investigations. He calls this noticing an aspect, an experience. There are two types of seeing. We see Stephen Colbert exercising on an elliptical exercise machine, and we see Stephen Colbert exercising on an elliptical machine as a desperate man trying to overcome caffeine withdrawals. The first is seeing, take it, the second is seeing as thinking, the dawning of an aspect. The first claim to a robust philosophy of humor is that humor is an aspect change. We see the world, and then we see it as something else. The seeing of an aspect does not have to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. There can be many aspects seen in an object or a situation. We see the world, A equals A, what philosophers call a, a tautologous relationship, then we see the world differently, A equals B, or A equals B and C, a revealing relation. When, so when Stephen Colbert visited the Constitution Center in Philadelphia during their primary, he noticed that one of the signers of the Constitution, Governor Morris, had a peg leg. Colbert says, he has a peg leg. The guide says, yes. Colbert says, how many of the founding fathers were pirates? <laughs> In character, Colbert doesn't ask how Governor Morris got the peg leg. Rather, he brings in another aspect, an association of a peg leg and pirates, and then assuming in typical Colbert fashion that he is right, asked a question, re and asked a, co a question regarding the founding fathers and pirates. Stephen Colbert effectively created a change of aspect. Though we have the ability to see the world differently in many ways at the same time, it is not the case that we do this all the time. There are certain things we just accept as they are. This is uh, from Wittgenstein. It would have made as little sense for me to say, now I'm seeing it as, as to say at the sight of a knife and fork, now I'm seeing this as a knife and fork. This expression would not be understood <coughs> any more than now it's a fork, or it can be a fork too. He says, one doesn't take what one knows as the cutlery at a metal for cutlery 
any more than one ordinarily tries to move one's mouth as one eats or aims at moving it. Wittgenstein is making this distinction here between normally going about our day and the experience of an aspect change. We are not constantly interpreting what we see in our environment. We see a table and use it as a table and don't question it, unless you're a carpenter or a philosopher. Though it gives us a story explaining how humor works, aspect change alone does not tell us why we laugh. What I mean by this distinction is that there can be many reasons for why people laugh, as stupid as they may be, that are particular to their tastes and dispositions, but that the mechanism that allows this to happen, the change of aspects, remains the same. And not all aspect changes are funny. What makes an aspect change funny depends on the circumstances under which the dawning of an aspect was made, the form of life, the humorous attitude, and lastly, an avowal. It's not the slide I want. We need a form of life, a web of shared human relationships, a commonality of everyday life. A form of life is different for humans than it is, say, for, for lions. Wittgenstein says, if a lion could talk, we could not understand him. A lion interacts and communicates with other lions in ways that are obviously different to the way that a human, a human interacts and communicates with other humans. Lions, for instance, never interrupt each other when consuming the still warm carcass of an antelope, <laughs> unlike my brother Irving. <laughs> Even if the lion had a, a language that was similar to English, the colloquialisms and ways of expressing himself would still be foreign to us. At best, he would be misunderstood. In order to have a language, we need a shared set of rules for the language. What also comes from these rules are non-speaking verbal cues and a social context that helps us understand the meaning and intention behind every speech activity. Maybe it's the next one. Oops. No. Here we go. The green Starbucks logo, logo centered on a white paper to-go cup is part of our form of life. It represents the coffee conglomerate Starbucks, and we associate the cup and logo with mass consumerism of specialty coffee and the tempting aromas of free trade, cage-free, grass-fed Sumatran honey dragon blends. In order to understand the humor in the last scene of Threat Down mentioned earlier, the shower scene, one would have to be able to recognize the logo on St Stephen Colbert's cup as a Starbucks logo and immediately make the connection that the black liquid Stephen Colbert is pouring on his head is indeed Starbucks coffee. The Kalahari Bushmen in Africa who don't have a concept of to-go coffee or know about the addictive nature of caffeine would not understand the humor that is portrayed in Stephen Colbert's plight caused by the three hour closing of Starbucks coffee shops because the Bushmen have a different form of life. Wittgenstein wrote, to imagine a language is to imagine a form of life. Any human language needs a context, agreed rules, and shared experiences in order for communication to happen. These are all part of a form of life. Though having a shared form of life is necessary, it is not a sufficient condition for humor. You can get a group of Californians in the same room, but just because they share a form of life does not mean they will find the same things funny. Yet when the form of life is not shared, the humor attempted to convey is impossible to get. In his book, I Am America and So Can You, Stephen Colbert has a whole chapter on religion. At the top, of course, is Roman Catholicism. He says, Jesus founded only one church, and it wasn't Unitarian. He took his <laughs> apostle Simon and made him into a rock and built a church on him. It's called the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, or church for short. He goes on to lambast every major organized religion in America, Protestantism, Episc Episcopal Church, Methodism, Presbyterianism, Presbyterianism, Baptists, Quakers, Mormonism, Judaism, then listed under other heathens, Shinto, Hinduism, and Buddhism. <laughs> but when it comes to Islam, though it is still listed under other heathens, it says, 
Islam is a great and true religion revealed in the Holy Quran, which was dictated by the angel Gabriel to the final prophet Muhammad. Blessing and peace be upon him. <laughs> the entry is followed by footnote 16, which says, Islam is a great and true religion revealed in the Holy Quran, which was dictated by the angel Gabriel to the final prophet Muhammad. Blessing and peace be upon him. At first glance, it looks as though Colbert is holding back and that there's nothing funny about this entry. But Salman Rushdie would disagree. If one has the background knowledge about the uprising of Muslims all over the world regarding the publication of Muslim cartoons in the Danish paper Jyllands Potsdam in September 2005, as well as the many death threats against those who speak out against Islam, one gets the joke. The humor in Colbert's entry on Islam lies in the fact that he's so concerned about Muslim fanatics threatening his life that he doesn't dare say anything negative about Islam. And the fact that he doesn't say anything bad or funny about Islam based on his fear is, in fact, funny. Though the only way to appreciate the humor here is to have a cultural background where one knows about the ongoing conflict of free speech and the Muslim jihadists, one needs to share in the form of life where this conflict is expressed and talked about. Humor, humor is an aspect change, and to understand the humor is our shared cultural community. We need a shared form of life, but these still are not sufficient for a robust philosophy of humor. We also need a humorous attitude. Humorous attitude is what I call an individual's predisposition to find something funny, or the set of things an individual finds funny. Um, I'll call this H.A. And H.A. comes from our lifetime of experience, and it shapes the way one thinks. It disposes us towards a certain way of looking at the world. It frames the way we see an aspect change. It is the taste or palate of humor. And H.A. explains why some jokes cross cultural and political boundaries, and others don't. And H.A. shows how some jokes are tailored to certain political groups, and other jokes are apolitical. For example, he says in his book, India has one of the most rigid and complex class structures. Based upon their behavior and past lives, all Indians are born into different strata of society called castes, or castes, I guess, castes. These castes forever determine what level of tech support questions they are allowed to answer. The people who, most likely, who are most likely to think this is funny are those Americans who have been helped by tech support personnel based in foreign countries and who are familiar with India's strict case system. A man in Bangladesh who works for Microsoft is unlikely to find this humor funny unless he has a very wide, complex HA or wicked sense of self-loathing that he's working on with a therapist. When we find something funny, we ascribe a multiform seeing as property to it that combines our present situation with the history of our garnered concepts. You may be wondering what is the connection between sharing a form of life and having a humorous attitude. Attitudes require a certain surrounding. They don't just happen on their own. There isn't a mental cause to these attitudes, but a context that is provided by one's abilities and is based on what led to the event as well as what happened after and the social community in which these personal attitudes arise. The background then is the form of life and the HA is the individual predisposition one has to finding something funny. That so many Americans enjoy the humor of Stephen Colbert is a testament to his genius in being able to produce an aspect change of American life that connects to people's HA. Finally, for our robust philosophy of humor, we need an avowal. An avowal is, in philosophy is often claimed as an endorsement to what we see. The best example of an avowal for humor is laughter or a smile. Another avowal, avowal can be simply a declaration. That's really funny. Though in some primitive cultures, nothing short of a spontaneous combustion will do. But I claim that there is what we might call negative avowals too, saying that's not funny, or diversifying yourself of overripe produce, or avowals of disapproval over a joke that has fallen flat. 
One's HA is what allows a person to think something is funny, and the avowal is what confirms it. Likewise, the HA may prevent a person from finding something funny, and their avowal of disapproval, along with their rotting groceries, confirm it. An odd fact about human psychology is that the more people who express their HA through avowals, the funnier the object of their humor becomes. Watching the Colbert Report, one will often notice how Stephen Colbert plays on the avowal of the audience, encouraging their clapping and hollering, which in turn prepares them for laughing. Even when a joke bombs, Stephen Colbert is able to turn the audience's disapproving avowal into another aspect change, thereby creating a new opportunity for humor, as well as impressing the ladies. This, in fact, is exactly what happened when he gave his address at the 2006 White Horse House Correspondents' Dinner. Attending the dinner were the elite of the conservative right and included then President George W. Bush. <coughs> Stephen Colbert, in character as a right-wing pundit, addressed the president. He said, Tonight's my privilege to celebrate this president. We're not so different, he and I. We get it. We're not brainiacs on the nerd patrol. We're not members of the Fatinista. We go straight from the gut. Right, sir? That's where the truth lies, right down here in the gut. Throughout his speech, Stephen Colbert used traditional Republican values to criticize the administration. I believe the government that governs the best is the government that governs the least. And by these standards, we have set up a fabulous government in Iraq. And included an attack on the president. Now I know there are some polls out there saying this man has a 32% approval rating. But guys like us, we don't pay attention to the polls. We know that polls are just a collection of statistics that reflect what people are thinking in reality, and reality has a well-known liberal bias. <laughs> so don't pay attention to the approval ratings that say 68% of Americans disapprove of the job this man is doing. I ask you this, does that not also logically mean that 68% approve of the job he's not doing? Think about it, I haven't. <laughs> Notice the change of aspect from 68% disapprove of the job he's doing to 68 approve of the job he's not doing, implying the criticism many Americans have shared since the attacks on the U.S. and Hurricane Katrina, that President Bush has done little for the majority of the American population. In fact, Stephen Colbert's next jab directly addresses this. <clears throat> I stand by this man. I stand by this man because he stands for things. Not only for things, he stands on things. Things like aircraft carriers and rubble and recently flooded city squares. And that sends a strong message that no matter what happens to America, she will always rebound with the most powerfully staged photo ops in the world. There was much more that he said, and uh, you can watch it on YouTube if you want. And in the end, his speech was met with respectful silence. Silence, too, can be an avowal. In this case, an indication that either Stephen Colbert's audience did not think he was funny, or if they did, they did not feel comfortable admitting that he was funny. And that's funny. <laughs> the Washington media declared that Stephen Colbert bombed based on the reaction in the immediate audience. To the blogger media and Comedy Central fans, however, Colbert was a hit. This difference in opinion is a difference in humorous attitudes but also, it shows how one's disapproving avowal can affect another's avowal of approval, as noted on the Time blog from, the, from James Ponywozik. He says, Colbert wasn't playing to the room. If anything, he was playing against the room. To the audience that would watch Colbert on Comedy Central, the pained, uncomfortable, perhaps a little scared to laugh reaction shots were not signs of failure. They were the money shots. They were the whole thing. The complexity of Colbert humor involves the ability to play on an audience's disapproving avowal for orchestrating an approving avowal for a much larger audience. This playing of avowals in comedy is now achievable with large audiences thanks to the advances of technology. Stephen Colbert possibly is the first comedian to successfully pull it off with the internet. So, why is Stephen Colbert so funny? First, 
This humor shows us American culture from the aspect of a stiff, conservative ideologue that allows us to laugh not only at Stephen Colbert, but also his interpretation of particular events. The aspect change connects to many viewers' humorous uh, attitudes, though those who either are critical of conservative ideology or those conservatives who have a wide humorous attitude and can appreciate the hypocrisy and irony in some of Stephen Colbert's portrayal, portrayal of American culture and values. That so many people are able to enjoy Stephen Colbert's humor is a testament to our shared form of life. Finally, that Stephen Colbert is able to incite so many avowals in people, good and bad, is a testament to his ability to affect media in ways that only a brilliant entertainer and bona fide cultural force could do. I think I'm out of time, right? Yeah. I have a, I have a short clip if you want to see it, but um, I well, if you want to, but maybe it'll take away from the Q&A. Q &A. Um, we started a little late because of the tech difficulties. Right. How long is the clip? It's like three minutes. That's right. We don't have to see prevails. it. That's um, right. We can go to the vote. That's, it. Uh, That's okay. Okay. But, well, thank you. Thank you. We're maybe about 10 minutes behind schedule, but I think we do have time for a couple questions. For or, or we could just, I could just talk, I mean, answer questions during the break. Or we could just do that. <laughs> what do you prefer? Any questions immediately for Sophia? Yeah, just a quick logical one. Um, okay. To say that a humorous attitude is a necessary component of a robust theory of humor, mm -hmm. isn't that circular? How is it circular? Well, you're trying to tell us what belongs to, what distinguishes something humorous from anything else. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, Knowing, you know, having a humorous attitude, and you know the the backup question then, and maybe we should make a break. Is what is a humorous attitude? And that can't be explained by saying a humorous attitude is an attitude that includes uh, predisposition to humor. It's just so what the humorous attitude is trying to pick out is the individual's person, the individual's um, past experiences, right? And so, so even though we share a form of life, right? Right. It's not, the form of life isn't going to be able to explain why this particular person, or say, why the people in, um, why the Republicans who were at the White House Correspondents' Dinner didn't find it funny. What's going to explain that is the humorous attitude, right? Their own individual connection to Republicans some of them might have found it funny, but didn't want to laugh. Okay, let's use a tougher example. Sarah Silverman. Okay. Right, she gives a, a talk at the TED Foundation, and I thought it was really terrific, but the guy who invited her disowned it completely because of a joke she told. Mm -hmm. And it was like this, she wanted to adopt a retarded kid, and you know, uncomfortable laughter. But if she was gonna die, What's going to happen to the kid? Who's going to take care of the kid? She thought and thought, but then she found a solution. She'd adopt a retarded kid with a terminal illness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's beyond the beyond. It's not making fun of any culture. It's almost taking the, um, the nature of humor and inverting it against itself. The president said, I didn't invite her. I would, if I knew she was going to say that, I would never have invited her. She said some worse things, too. And to say that, well, you know, some people were laughing nervously, some were na laughing, and so on. And to say that, you can go down the line and say, well, this person has this kind of a, a humorous attitude, and this person has a lesser one, and this person is more attuned to that kind of humor, and this person is offended by it, and so on doesn't seem to explain very much. No, because um, that is not sufficient, right? A humorous attitude, I'm not claiming is, is sufficient to explain why somebody laughs, right? But it's gonna explain why one person laughs and one doesn't, because they have a whole set of connected relationships based on past experiences, based on their own values, based on what their grandmother said to them at, at four years old, right? They have all this 
So I think that when you are talking about humor, you need to account for people's different dispositions towards humorous content. Yeah. I guess I'm just gonna repeat myself. To say people have different dispositions and to say people have different humorous attitudes is to say the same thing, it's a tautology. But okay. what do I know? That's okay, we can agree to disagree, we can talk about You're it. Right, we can, but I enjoyed the paper and I thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. Yeah, so I, I will address the issue also. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Sophia, I don't mean to cut you off, but I think no, we yeah, will no. take about a 10 minute break. Um, so thank you to all the graduate speakers and Sophia.